Hello and welcome. In that video, I ran and went over some code that sorts bytes in the screen buffer, and I talked mainly about the, the main loop, the glue code, and a lot about the timer, but I didn't really go over the quicksort algorithm and how that got coded up. So today, what I'd like to do is walk through that assembly code so you can see how the partitioning works and also how the recursion works. Before continuing, you will probably want to remind yourself about the quicksort algorithm and how that works. Uh, I have posted another video that shows how that works. Um, in particular, we're doing the three-way partitioning. So uh, if you don't remember all the details, and who does, uh, you might want to give that video a look before looking at this one, because this will make a lot more sense if you look at that one first. All right. As you might recall from before, call, calling the other sort subroutines is pretty simple. It's just one line. So if you want to call bubble sort, you just call, you just do this. Um, the stuff on either side of it is just the timer stuff. So the insertion sort is the same way. It's just one opcode to call it. Quick sort, on the other hand, is a little bit more complicated because it takes parameters on the stack so that each recursive call can send different parameters each time and then like narrow down its scope of what it's sorting. So here is where we call the subroutine, but you'll notice that the timer stuff is all the way up here and then down here. So what's going on in the middle? In the middle, we have to pass the two parameters that it needs. It needs the first parameter as the start of the list. So we load D with this symbol that tells us where the screen buffer starts and we push it. And the second parameter is where the list ends. So we have the symbol for the start, add the size and subtract one. Load that into D, that's where it ends, and we push that as the second parameter. Now we're ready to call quicksort. When quicksort returns, those parameters are still on the stack. I'm using a convention where the caller pushes and pulls. So this just adds four onto the stack, which is the equivalent of pulling two 16-bit items off. So at this point, the stack is balanced, and then we can do our timing info. So let's actually drill into quicksort and see how that works. So quicksort has three steps. First, it does a three-way partitioning. Then it does a recursive call on the portion to the left of the pivots, and then a recursive call on the portion to the right of the pivots. Um, as you may recall from the quicksort introduction video, there are a lot of pointers that we need to keep track of, and we're using most every register. In fact, it's kind of convenient. We have like just the right number of registers for all of this. So LT and GT, which mark where all of the things less than the pivot will be to the left of this, and all the things greater than the pivot will be to the right of this, we're using X and Y. Our cursor is U, so U is pointing at the current element that we're comparing with the pivot, and we're using B to have the actual value of the pivot. I'm using C notation here, so these are all pointers. And then this implies we're going into the pointer to grab the value, and we use B to store the value. And then we use A for various things throughout, just as a scratch register. So in the very beginning, we initialize our pointers, our registers. And you'll see we're doing these operations on the stack. So the stack starts off with the first parameter here, then we pushed the second parameter here, and then the 6809 pushed the return address there. So the stack is pointing right at the return address. So we would need to add two to get to high, and we would need to add four to get to low. And we're just gonna keep low and high on the stack because it's a very convenient place to just keep them around. We don't have to put them anywhere else. So when we need to refer to them, we're just going to use S and we're gonna index into S the appropriate amount. 
So that's what this is doing. So to grab the low, we add four to X and we're sticking that in X for now. And that's where LT starts. So X is gonna stay that and then it's gonna continue to increase as LT goes to the right. And as our base case, we compare whether our low is strictly less than the high. If it's not, we're done. And so that's what's happening over here. QS done is nothing but an RTS. And then we initialize our GT, which is our high, and we get that off of the stack. And we're gonna use A to grab the pivot, which is right wherever X is pointing. So the pivot starts off being at low. We're gonna stick that into A just so we can stick A here. So we're using a variable, a pivot, an area of memory, which is defined right here. We need this in a memory location so we can do comparisons. You can't compare a register with another register on the 6809. So when you want to compare two values, at least one of them has to or one of them has to be in a memory address somewhere. Unless you're using immediate mode with a constant, but these are varying values, so we need to have this stored in memory. So we've initialized our variable there, and then u is our cursor, so u also starts off being at low. So now we're ready to start our loop. I is the address of the cursor, it's where we're pointing, and we're gonna be using that in comparisons as well. So we store u into i, i is a memory location just like pivot, right over here. You'll see it's two bytes because it's an address. And we know our partitioning is done once gt and i cross over. So we compare our gt, which is in y, with our cursor. And if gt happens to be less than the cursor, that means we've crossed over and we're done with the loop. Otherwise, we initialize b with wherever the cursor is pointing. So this is really the current element that we're considering. And this is the big thing. We're comparing that element with the pivot. This is what decides exactly what's going to happen on this iteration of the loop. There are three possibilities. Either it's less than the pivot, it's greater than the pivot, or equal to the pivot. So we do our branching on less than and greater than, and if we fall through, then that means it's equal, so we'll do that case first. When B, which is our current element, our cursor, is equal to the pivot, all we do is we advance the cursor. So we just add one to U, and then we branch up. The second case is that our cursor is smaller than the pivot. In which case we need to do two things. We need to exchange whatever is at LT with whatever is at the cursor, and then we advance both LT and the cursor. So we grab what's at LT, B is already the cursor, and then we do the exchange. These two stores do the exchange, and they're also doing an auto increment. So when you do this, right after the store is completed, then U will be incremented right after the store is completed, X will be incremented. And so that's how we can get our LT and our cursor to advance. Third case is greater than pivot. The thing we're looking at is bigger, in which case we exchange what's at I and what's at GT and decrement GT. And so it's quite similar and so we're doing this. But there's one thing I wanna point out. We were able to do this slick stuff up here, this auto increment, because we want to store something somewhere and we want to move it along at the same time. Can't really do that in this case. We're splitting it into two pieces. So we are storing our I wherever GT is pointing, and then in a completely separate instruction, we're then decrementing GT. Why can't I do these together in a single opcode like I could over here. Well, your first guess is how you, at how you might do it would be this. You just store your B wherever Y is pointing and then you decrement Y. But decrements always happen before the store and increments always happen after the store. So what we really want is this, which doesn't exist. Instead, we have to decrement y and then do the store. So this might be the next thing you think you could do. Okay, so we'll decrement y, and when we store b, we'll use this index to compensate for the fact that y decremented. But 6809 does not let you use an index here and an auto increment or auto decrement. You can't use both, only one or the other. So I'm forced to do two separate instructions. That made me sad. 
So we've handled then all the three cases and so we just go back up to the top of the loop and keep on going until the loop decides it's done. Once it's done, then the fun stuff happens. Then we can do our recursive calls. So these are the two recursive calls. We need to call quicksort from low up to LT minus one. And after that, we need to call quicksort starting at GT plus one and going up to high. So that means that by the time I get here, I still have to have GT available to me. So one of the things I need to do before I start is I'm gonna push GT onto the stack, not because it's a parameter, not because it's part of the recursion, but just because I need to save that value so I can retrieve it later. And in preparation for the first call, I need to decrement LT because LT minus one will be our second parameter. And I need to grab low again. I had grabbed low before, I put that in LT, I moved LT, so I kind of lost my low, but my low is still on the stack. So I'm sticking my low into D. And now I'm ready to push the parameters for that first recursive call. So I push D, because that's the first parameter, that's low. Then I push X, that's the second parameter, and that is going to be my LT minus one. Now I can call my quicksort, and now I have to balance out the stack. So remember my convention is the, the caller both pushes and pulls the parameters off. So with this, I'm done with the first recursive call. Now I can restore Y, which was GT, and I can fix it up so that it's ready for the next recursive call. Uh, y needs, or GT needs one added to it because that's our first parameter. And our trusty stack still has high, so I can grab that and stick it into D. And now I can make my second recursive call. I push my first parameter, which is GT plus one. I push my second parameter, which is high. And then I call. And then again, I balance out the stack by pulling the parameters I just pushed. That's it. One other thing I'd like to point out is this nifty include feature in LWASM. I don't actually have any of the printing code in this file at all. I'm reusing it from previous programs and I just centralized them into this reusable file, Print Utilities. So with this include instruction, LWASM, when it encounters this, will just make believe that the contents of this file were actually in this overall outer file, and will just like spew that ASM directly into the assembler. And if you look at the output from LWASM as it's doing the assembly, you'll see here's all stuff from QSASM. Here's my main, got a few methods here. Blah, 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 blah. And then I got here, I got to the include print utilities. So what did it do? Now it said, all right, whatever I was doing, that's put on hold. Now I'm going to just spew everything from printutilities.asm. I don't know why the M isn't here. But everything from printutilities.asm is going to now go into the assembler. So now it's just like showing me everything from that file. These are my print utilities, clearing the screen, printing integers and stuff. When that file is done, then we return back to qs.asm, wherever we left off, and then we can finish it up with the symbols and data and array and stuff. So I thought it would be interesting to watch the stack in action using the main debugger. And it's also not a bad idea when you're coding up recursive stuff to make sure you're balancing the stack properly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a breakpoint here. This is right before we clear out the timer and then push the parameters call quicksort. And we're gonna look at what happens to the stack as we go through this area. So we're gonna set a breakpoint here at 403F. Okay, we're about to start doing timer stuff. Let's look at our stack. Our stack is at 7F33. We're actually a little bit higher, but 33 is gonna be, actually let's, let's go to 7F20. So 33 is 31, two, three. So we're pointing right here, and we're gonna see what happens both to the stack pointer over here and to the memory as we continue through this. So we're pushing our first parameter, and so this 33 becomes a 31. And you'll see our OEOO got pushed. That's the beginning of our buffer. 
We pushed our second parameter, we're now at 7F2F, and we pushed our OFFF. Now this is going to call quicksort, and a lot of stuff is going to happen with the stack, but by the time it gets back, this pointer should stay the same. So 7F2F should not change. And sure enough, we're back at 7F2F. You might have noticed that some other values came into play here because they got pushed and then pulled. And now we have to undo those two parameters that we pushed, so we're going to add 4 to S. And S is now back at 7F33. We can also set a breakpoint on the entry to quicksort, and we can watch that stack pointer go up and up and up and up and up to see how far up it has to go, say, for the uh, initial chain of recursive calls, which is right here, and that's address 4074. We're at our first breakpoint where we're pushing the parameters for the initial call. So the stack is at 7F33. Now we're at our second breakpoint, so we're on entry, so it's at 7F2D. And each time we go, it gets earlier and earlier. And if I take a look at the stack here, maybe we'll go to 7D100. Let's actually go to 7 E00. So we're around here right now, so we would expect to see numbers from here and earlier start to change. You'll see it doesn't use a heck of a lot of stack space. The buffer is small enough that we don't need to have too much on the stack at once. And that was the complete call to quicksort. I hope you found that interesting, and as always, thanks for watching.